tak ada lagu raya dulu ke start Nanti lah Nanti UMT tambahkan so, Alright We are live On YouTube so Good morning uh, Good afternoon Good evening Depends on where you are in the world And you're listening in Welcome to all our YouTube uh, viewers and listeners To Session seven and the second day of the World Turtle Day Open House 2020. As you may have been following over the last uh, day and a half, we were hosted by the Society for Conservation Biology Blazing Chapter. So this uh, session seven, adapting turtle conservation to the new normal, research, education, and fundraising is going to take about two hours, and I'm your your moderator. I'm Danisha Sharma, uh, Strategic Advisor to the Green Growth Asia Foundation and also Director of the Malaysian Wildlife Conservation Foundation. So as we know, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, numerous turtle projects are put on hold following the Malaysian nationwide enforcement of the Movement Control Order, or the MCO as we call it. And now we've got something called the Conditional Movement Control Order, basically to help curb the spread of the virus as has been happening in many countries. But as a result, you know, leaders and managers of turtle conservation projects are working you know, doubly hard to ensure that turtles remain protected, uh, project assistance are safe, and the morale of the local communities are intact. And at the same time, racing against time to secure new funding opportunities to sustain the existing operations. So in this session, the panelists that we have lined up will share about their strategies, their methodologies, uh, that they put in place to move their projects forward, including their research activities, their educational programs, and even their fundraising initiatives. So they'll go in turn. We'll take about 15 or 20 minutes uh, per presenter, per panelist, and then we'll open the floor to entertain the questions that you may have. And, and the way it works is you, you keep posting your questions anyway. So we'll try and compile them and, and raise them up to the whole panel or to individual panel members as, as you deem appropriate. So we have, uh, we're very lucky to have with us today uh, a bunch of young, not compared to me anyway, uh, talented, uh, passionate uh, people who have been working on the front lines of turtle conservation with their teams and with local communities. So I'd like to just introduce them very briefly and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about them when we come to their presentation. So we have uh, Liana Iswin Khalid uh, with the Marine Research Foundation. Hi. Give us away. Hello. <laughs> We have Noor Alia Amira Afandi from the Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia. There she is. We have Nakuya Fadzil from the Perhenti and Eco Educational Project. And we have uh, Shir Chua Lasalvi from Batu Batu Resort and Tengah Island Conservation. And finally, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Uze Rusli from the Sea Turtle Research Unit or Sea True University, Malaysia, Trangano. So these are all our uh, young and uh, passionate turtle conservationists. So let's, uh, let's get the ball rolling. Let's get the ball rolling. So I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, Noor Alia Amira, we'll call her Alia, uh, from the Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia. Alia graduated with a bachelor's degree in marine biology from the University of Malaysia Trondano, uh, UMT, and now works for the Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia as an education and community outreach officer. So she arranges and conducts uh, educational programs for schools in Trangano, uh, particularly in the Kamaman district. So Alia, it's all yours. Let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Uh, okay, um, thank you. Thank you for the brief introduction. Um, Again, my name is Alia and I'm the Education and Community Outreach Officer from TCS. So I'm just going to jump right in, save us some time. <laughs> I hope I'm not talking too fast because I'm really hyped up on caffeine right now. All right, so anyways, um, Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia is the only NGO in Malaysia that is focusing on the conservation work on uh, freshwater turtles. So we are established since 2011 and we are based in Kemaman Terengganu. 
And our vision is um, basically to restore the symbolism of turtles um, in the state of Terengganu. Um, and um, our aim um, basically is to recover the uh, wild population number of um, freshwater turtles in Malaysia. And for us to do that basically is to uh, this four main approach that is uh, research, conservation, awareness, and education. So we conduct a, a community-based research um, and conservation project at Kampung Pasir Gajah Kemaman, where we really involve the local community um, in our projects. So some of the uh, research that we had already conducted is the temperature-dependent sex determination, the movement and home range studies. And um, actually last year, we collaborated with Dr. Dahlia uh, from UMT. She's the expert on fungi to actually study the effects of fungi on river terrapin eggs. And in terms of conservation, we um, focus on the southern river terrapin, which is actually listed as the top 25 most critically endangered freshwater turtles and tortoises worldwide. Um, so our conservation uh, effort includes the uh, egg protection program. Where we collect and uh, where we collect and relocate um, terrapin eggs from the nesting banks um, to be incubated ex situ in our uh, incubation eh, in our hatchery at the um, village. So the uh, newly emerged hatchlings will be head started um, for a few months in our pond um, so that they grow bigger and stronger before we release them back into the river, uh, the Kamama River. So prior to their release, of course, we will uh, be inserting microchips into them so that they have uh, their permanent ID. And awareness, yes. Uh, awareness is also very important to us because not everyone knows about terrapins. Um, even the local in Kampo Pasir Gajah, some of them only have heard of terrapins. They haven't seen any terrapins. So um, awareness is very important, So uh, which includes, um, of course, the awareness talk. And we will also bring uh, some of our uh, turtle specimens, um, wet and dry, uh, a few species here actually for, you know, for the general public to actually come and see. And we also uh, conduct some few very fun activities for the kids. This is basically to occupy them so that uh, the adults can have uh, ample time to actually see and, and hear more and listen, uh, hear and, and uh, learn more about our freshwater turtles. And we also sell uh, some merchandises as well as part of our fundraising. So we, fund, uh, we fundraise to actually support our data conservation projects, um, which also includes our education um, programs as well. So some of the uh, merchandises that we sell here, as you can see at the back, um, we fashion our own therapy motif batik, which we were the, we are the only one producing in Malaysia, um, to fashion into merchandises that are readily used, and and we also involve the local women community. Um, so they hand make all these products um, as part of our initiative, uh, the Women Empowerment uh, Initiative that we um, started last year, and we have uh, quite uh, a range of products that um, you guys can check out on our online website. All right. Okay, so education, education. We are very, 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 very big on education. I really, truly enjoy going to schools, um, talking to the kids. We play a lot of games. Uh, we interact a lot. And what I really love is, uh, is actually being able to see the change in attitude and and uh, action for, for the kids, even during the program. So um, we particularly engage uh, rural schools around Kemaman because um, usually mm, their parents or their aunts or the adults in the family would probably have, at least uh, one of them, have uh, eaten turtle eggs, um, if not river therapy eggs. Um, so this is a, a good way to sort of like a, the nice way to brainwash, <laughs> brainwash the kids uh, so that whatever they've learned from our program, they can actually share it back to their family. And that is also helping us with the outreach. So um, our education program ranges from kids, kindergarten kids to um, young adults. Um, this uh, particular program is uh, from, uh, I, I forgot the name of the 
of the kindergarten, but um, it's really fun. Um, they were very in interested to learn about um, river therapies, to learn about um, freshwater turtles, any turtles basically. So they will get the chance to actually look at our uh, therapy gallery and whole, whole uh, 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 river therapy um, hatchlings too. And it's cute. Some of them were scared, some of them were like very excited. And we also conduct turtle camps. So turtle camps is a um, outdoor learning experience um, approach, sorry, outdoor learning approach that we are extremely proud of because um, during this time, you know, the, the kids, they, they learn to, they, they listen to the turtle talk under these kind of casual in the trees and, you know, feel the breeze of the ocean and hear the sound of the waves. It's really, it's really interesting to see the change um, of uh, behavior, especially uh, with, the, with the kids that are, are initially quiet, they suddenly became more interactive, they are more energetic, they are more excited and they, they are more open to uh, accepting new information. And you'll be surprised that actually um, they retain a lot of a lot more information um, through this the, the camps. And we've got this information um, from the survey that we conducted at, at, uh, prior, prior to the start of the program and the end of the program. So we also run a few fun games with them as well. And um, the, I feel like the outdoor learning process is really important because that is where the, the, the children were, will be able to um, reconnect with the environment. Because now, nowadays, um, everyone is like using their tablets and like, um, all their uh, uh, playing, playing, I don't know, looking at Facebook and stuff. So uh, this is a good opportunity for them to actually explore and like be out there and be out there. Yeah. Okay. And we also conduct uh, outreach programs to schools as well. Um, similar thing, we will bring um, our specimens uh, to the school. And last year, we actually had uh, permission from Jabatan Perhilitan to actually bring out some of our young hatchlings to schools. Um, yeah, so this um, creates a lot of uh, more awareness. And last year as well, we actually um, had a lot of collaborators as well. Um, we um, invite other organizations to open up both. Um, organizations such as, um, we invited C2 uh, from UNP, uh, DOF, um, Pahilitan, the Pangolin group from UNP. Um, so it was really fun. And the kids um, actually get to, uh, get to learn a lot and they really enjoyed, they really enjoyed this program. So last year, up to last year only, we had already reached um, around 17 schools and we've um, talked to more than um, almost 700 uh, teachers and we've reached around 6,000 kids, 6,000 students. Right, uh, pandemic. <laughs> okay, so, um, Definitely, definitely, the pandemic has uh, hindered all of our programs and operations, um, especially especially in terms of education programs. So um, basically, prior to the implementation of MCO, we actually just started running our um, education program for the year 2020. And we actually had a lot of outreach programs that was already in line and set to go for the next few months. Um, but then uh, we had to, you know, postpone them, unfortunately. And uh, when it term, in, in terms of discovery trips, we also had uh, some few trips that were also ready, ready and set, and we just had to run them. Um, but we also have to, like, you know, uh, we couldn't, we couldn't proceed with the trips. Uh, that is very unfortunate. And also, few days, uh, I would say, around a few, few days, yeah, few days before our um, annual leave, oh sorry, before uh, the implementation of the first MCO, we were actually in the midst of um, finalizing, finalizing our annual therapy release program, um, annual therapy release event, sorry, event that we initially uh, planned to launch on the 21st March um, this year because we, we plan to make this like a big thing because we had a lot of um, hatchlings to be released. And, and we, want it, we want it to be the, the, the it, we want it to be the most um, glamorous, <laughs> glamorous uh, um, 
launching. But uh, however, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19, the outbreak uh, happened. So that left us with um, all of our hatchlings still with us. And uh, with regards to all of this, um, we do face uh, financial challenges because uh, the discovery trips is one of the main source of income for our organization. And um, unfortunately, we are unable to do that anymore. And the annual, well, in terms of annual therapy release day, we, we are left with more than uh, 700 therapies right now in our head stuffing pond. And we are still waiting, uh, we, we are still um, uh, getting new hatchlings from this year's eggs. Uh, right now, we have more than 100 uh, new hatchlings. And we are still waiting, uh, there are still more eggs being incubated. Um, so uh, we do need to feed them, right? Um, they, need, they do need to eat and um, pellets, we have to buy, we have to buy uh, a lot of pellets. And for us to um, uh, overcome this challenge is basically we offered, um, uh, we offered a, 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 a path of like donation. We asked for help. We ask for help from our um, turtle lovers out there. You know, some donated um, uh, donate uh, pellets to help feed our river therapines, and we are very lucky that um, they are very they are very uh, sympathetic because <laughs> they love therapines. I, I hope, huh? and they they we we are, we are very appreciative. Yeah, um, there are a lot of people helping us. You know, to stay afloat and. Yeah, um, so far we're doing good. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we're doing good. Okay, so um, the new norm. Uh, to move forward, of course, we would have to change um, our mode of operations uh, to online because usually we're out there. Um, our operations are usually outdoors. So now we have to figure something out to you know adapt to the new norm. Um, one of the things that we are working on right now is producing um, more educational modules, um, which we have already um, uh, published on our website. Um, you, you can go and check it out. It's uh, free, it's downloadable. And uh, this unit, this educational unit is very helpful in, um, during MCO because, you know, some uh, parents are, you know, working from home and usually the kids are a bit distracting <laughs> yeah so they're a bit distracting so this uh, module is not only educational but it's also fun it's um it's friendly for adults it's friendly for kids and we are planning to publish more hopefully um you, you will see more soon and the second thing that we're working on is uh, online classes so um i am conducting a weekly online classes with um the voice brigades from kl so we talk about um, the turtles of Malaysia, we talk about river therapies, we talk about uh, their biological, morphological, um, and ecological aspects of them, and you know the threats and everything. So it's really fun, it's really fun. It's new for us as well. And I can see that, I can see us adopting this, um, this new thing to um, part of our education program because yeah, graphic does help. Uh, being out there interacting with the kids uh, is really fun and it's, uh, to me, it's more impactful. But um, we, we would learn, I, I, I am learning to um, actually um, maximize the use of our media, our internet connection and everything, Mr. Google. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the next thing that we have planned is basically to... Um, post a series of short educational videos on our social media channels. Um, this is sort of like the did you knows uh, videos, which will be very um, short and, and nice and sweet. And then we would, um, you know, basically proceed to uh, email marketing and, uh, you know, improvising our website in terms of search engine optimizing um, to increase, um, to improve our website and increase our um, searchability. And this is also a, a good opportunity for us to actually reconnect with our, you know, loyal supporters um, to build up that, that, that relationship with them. And we haven't had the time to do this before because we're always out there. But now um, we're taking advantage of MCO and uh, really just reconnecting with them. 
Um, right. So moving on to the third part is the partial partial online awareness program. Um, this is um, in terms of conducting more programs with the Kemaman schools. So uh, we can't really go to schools anymore. So um, partial in a sense that um, the talk will be online, um, but the materials we would we would uh, send few days prior to the date of the talk. But there is a concern in terms of um, the equipment uh, availability. Not not all schools have enough uh, enough or properly uh, working equipments. So that would be something for us to really um, think about. And um, as time progresses, um, we would really hope that the pandemic will you know die soon, so that we can slowly and gradually um, start going back to schools. And um, of course, with a slight change, we will have to like reduce the number of uh, student participants and follow the proper SOPs only and only if the school agrees and the condition is favorable. And also continue, um, continue taking uh, guests for our discovery trips. As I've mentioned before, that this is a uh, part of our um, main source of income. Um, other than um, selling of merchandises, um, so that's that's it for me. I think I hope I kept it like short and sweet. <laughs> so uh, back to you, Dato. I I must tell you, Alia, you yeah. you bring some great, you bring some really great uh, education and awareness work. Thank and you. So thank you on behalf of all of us, uh, all of thank us on the you. panel, and all of us who've been listening in and and, and watching you speak. Yeah. Thank so you. so uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. One one quick question. Yeah. I, I know that in the past, local communities actually waited for these river terrapins to come up to the river banks and used to camp out and, and take them and make pits and put them in and they collect the eggs and all that. Uh -huh. So so do people still eat some of the eggs in, in where you work? Um, unfortunately, yes, because um, they've been doing this since since their uncles and their grandfathers, grandfathers. So um, we to change uh, people's behavior is something that we still need to work on. And we um, honestly, I feel like uh, what we are doing is is that we are not trying to go into the kampung and, and exactly like tell people what to do because we are a, a community-based NGO. So their cooperation with us is really important. So we... Of course, we would love to save every single eggs, uh, therapy eggs that we can, but um, we don't want to go against them. But at the same time, we are slowly trying to make them understand the work that we do. Hmm. But I, I can tell you, Alia, be assured, uh, the work that you're doing, we may be challenged with the current generation of adults, but the kids that will become adults of tomorrow, they will be fully on board what you do. They will be fully supporting turtle conservation. We be, hope so. <laughs> be fully assured of that. Yeah, you're doing some we great work. That. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so no much. Problem. Okay, so we'll we'll move on. We'll move on. Uh, we'll go on to the next uh, presenter. Uh, that's uh, Nakuya Fatzil, who's from the Perhentian <laughs> Eco-Educational Project. Uh, okay. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, I've not met her in person, but I've, I've come to know that she's the project manager of the Perhentian Eco-Educational uh, Project. She's passionate about education and community-based conservation. So one more, something exciting to hear about. Since 2018, she has been working closely with the local community at the Perhentian Islands and uh, to ensure that the marine ecosystems are valued, they're conserved and sustainably managed. So over to you, we'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Dino. So hi everyone, Selamat Hari Raya. Um, I hope you're um, staying safe um, and well. Um, I'll be sharing my um, slides before I start. Yeah, so um, yeah, can you see this and can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So um, my name is Nakuya Fazil and I've been working with um, Fuse Eco Tier 
for almost three years now, leading the Perhentian Eco Education Project. So basically, um, Fuse Ecotier is a social enterprise company, which means we um, utilize our income um, to fund our own um, conservation projects. Um, so if you are wondering, um, the incomes basically comes from the volunteering fees as well as our um, ecotourism products, um, such as um, uh, group trips, um, you know, school trips, or even team building programs, as well as uh, research trips and expedition. Yeah. So under Fuse Ecotio, we have several um, conservation projects um, in Malaysia, as well as in Yogyakarta. Um, so in Malaysia, we have these um, three, uh, in Perhentian, we have these three projects, which is the Perhentian Turtle Project, which is led by uh, Miss Melissa. I'm sure you have met Miss Melissa if you joined um, last night's session. And then the second one is Perhentian Marine Research Station, which is led by uh, Miss Hidayah Halid. And then the Perhentian Eco Education Project. So the total project and the um, diving project basically is a research-based project. Um, and eco-education project sits in the middle where we utilize all the findings from these two projects and use it as an educational tools to educate the communities um, in Perhentian Island. Yeah. So, so it seems like it's a three different project. It's not, it's a one cohesive project um, and we work together as a team um to achieve the same vision basically um so talking about perhentian education project so um yeah all um what we want is really to have the local communities leading the conservation efforts in perhentian island um and so um in perhentian eco education project we have these three main elements um number one is um obviously the main element is education um, which we want to use education to really um, produce a group of young leaders to, um, to start uh, leading the conservation efforts in Perhentian. I'll be talking more into education after this. And then uh, the second element is the community um, as a community-based conservation project. Um, obviously, um, getting trust within the community is very important. Um, and so everything that the community does, we always want to involve ourselves in it. And um, everything that we do, we always want to involve the community in it. Yeah. So uh, we also support the local economy um, by introducing um, new um, ecotourism products such as um, eco snorkeling trip, as, uh, um, as well as uh, working really closely with the local ladies. Um, um, promoting their Malay dinner session and kuih making session, especially when we have our own groups, you know, coming to the islands doing um, research or um, school trips. Uh, we will always utilize their businesses um, to always um, working with them closely. And the um, third element is the waste management. So we work closely with the local communities. Um, the stakeholders as well as the local authorities in coming up um, a better plan for um, the waste management in Perhentian Islands that can be adopted um, by everyone. So basically, um, um, so talking about um, our project, which is the education, um, Perhentian Island is a very small island. Uh, basically, if you've come to Perhentian Island, uh, our projects are located in the village. And there is only one village in Perhentian, uh, which is um, located in Perhentian Kecil, which is the small island. Um, so it's a small village as well. It's a small village, and they only have one school, uh, which is a primary school, uh, Sekolah Kebangsaan Pulau Perhentian. Um, um, we, we, we have close relationship with the school, the teachers, the students, we know everyone and everyone knows us. Um, but after uh, they turn 13 years old, they have to leave the islands and go for a boarding school in Kuala Besut, um, which left us with a challenge of, you know, um, making sure the continuation of our education program leaving a big impact of um, producing these young leaders because obviously with the five years gap, um, um, it creates, you know, um, this gap and, and, and like a problem, like a, um, a hindrance, yeah. 
So um, basically, uh, what we've come up is um, like a, um, an education structure that we adopt and we use in our um, in our project. Uh, basically, we have um, weekly classes. Uh, every week, we have classes at the school. Um, English classes, we have eco clubs um, divided into juniors and seniors, and then as well as culture clubs. So these classes are very important, especially the eco clubs in providing um, the understanding of um, theory of science behind the marine um, conservation concept to the students. And so we focus on these eco club members, which are very active and involve them in research and uh, scientific data collection um, through citizen science based project. Um, so every day, actually, we, um, the kids will have their own schedule and they will come to our project house um, and be involved in um, all these citizen science um, activities. So basically, we have kayak patrol, we have photo watch, the kids have their own um, corals to guard and they take um, readings um, according to their schedules and also we have um, a recycling machine at the school so the kids would do um, beach cleanup and um, get it sorted and you know do data collection and recycle and recycle it to, um, to, to produce a new product which is um, a turtle pendants and a um, shark pendants. So uh, basically, uh, we focus um, on yeah, turtles and, 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 and corals, uh, marine conservation. So um, at the end of this, um, at the end of the season, um, every season basically, uh, we would um, have a group of um, selected students that will be funded um, a diving course. So um, they would be in the youth scuba diving programs. So basically, when they have this um, diving license, when they turn 13, they're kind of like committed. They are committed to do um, three scientific dives with our program. Uh, basically, um, diving with the um, diving project, as well as be um, involved in the turtle project. Um, doing night patrol at the nesting beach, as well as really learning um, to do turtle IDs, um, and then leading the classes and teaching their juniors back. So every every year we would produce a group of you know, um, kind of like seniors, and hopefully you know um, advancing from just a junior open water up to you know advanced rescue and at the end dive masters. And hopefully with this system, we could produce a young leaders from um, the local Perhentian uh, children um, so that they can lead um, the conservation efforts in Perhentian um, in the long run. So it's a very, it's a very um, long term project, um, but, um, but we, we do have um, this, you know, a few students are starting to you know are, um, arising and we see um, the passions in them because basically through education they start to understand um, when they start to understand they will start to love and when they start to love they will start to care and start to conserve um, so that is how we try to achieve um, our vision in Perhentian. Um, yeah so moving on uh, talking about COVID-19 pandemic um, obviously all the three elements are um, um, uh, affecting, uh, 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 affected by this pandemic, you know, all the educations, obviously we can't have any um, programs at the school, the school is closed, um, the kids aren't allowed to come to um, uh, of the houses, um, you know, we can't do any activities um, after school. If the schools are open, you know the, the rest of this year are you know just 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 not happening, um, and it's also affecting our community, the local community, um, as they depend on tourists so much. Um, sometimes um, some of the local ladies are also depending on our um, you know our school groups or volunteers to do play making session and stuff. So they were also um, affected. Yeah. And as for the company, uh, because we, obviously we don't have any volunteers coming in this year, all the group visits are um, cancelled. So yes, um, financially we are affected and by means of financially affected, all our conservation activities are also affected. 
yeah but um moving forward i think with all the stress from this pandemic it just brings out the um you know creative side in you you know you, you just um strive to survive and you just strive to be better and you know just getting out of these um issues or um pandemic yeah so um we say yes to everything virtual basically <laughs> everything virtual we say yes so um talking about our education programs um, we're just lucky because we work really closely with the students um, we have our own um, whatsapp group um, set up prior before um, the pandemic um, even started so um, we want to try zoom or you know other platforms it's just that some of the com you know the communities would have some of um, limitations in terms of coverage or even data, especially with the students, they would have limitations on data. So um, we are comfortable and we decided to you know um, resume our classes as usual um, through online platform, which is um, um, WhatsApp group. So yeah, every week we would do classes as as usual, um, following our module up to you know still September. Um, and um, we would send out um, like a videos, you know, I'm talking about um, topics of the week. Um, and we, if we were to do any um, experiments, the kids will also be able to do the experiments at home and then, you know, sharing their work or discussing any findings or, yeah, um, 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 create discussion in WhatsApp group. So that is how we continue with our project but um you know the rest which is the outdoor or the, the scientific the citizen science program um we we accept that this year we can't do anything about it but we're just preparing to do you know uh, more next year um hopefully <laughs> when this all ends um um as for our company um you know we 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 look into um, um, new products, all virtual um, products, as such as virtual field trips, and I think it's it's really are a trend, and uh, people are um, getting into it. Um, recently, we have a virtual field trips with um, Portsmouth University, where we would do um, we would share our research programs, you know, the turtle programs, as well as the terrestrial programs in Marapo and the citizen science program with this in um, students of um, from Portsmouth um, and then I think just from there we have a lot of um, you know interest even from parents who are you know now struggling to get to keep um, the kids entertained at home so they are looking into you know like um uh, a, 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 a conservation trips or even like a birthday trips but with um, a conservation theme um, so yeah, we started to, you know, just do um, either it's by fees or it, um, either it's by um, donation drives, um, but it does really help, um, you know, to keep um, the project sustained, um, at least for this year. Yeah, and uh, to touch on fundraising efforts, um, we, I think we are blessed that we have um, a group of um, crazy team members all around the world um i mean we um yeah, even in malaysia we we just have uh, crazy team members so whenever we do fundraising it's all about um you know making sure that you are visible um in the online um, community or in social media so it's always a crazy fundraising effort um for example like um um we did a um, hundred burpees um, and hours um, for straight um, 12 hours to fundraise for the turtle project. Um, and for example, we did um, a um, squat for 45 seconds wearing, you know, dive gears in dry land. It's just, you know, something crazy and you can like nominate your friends and in returns, it really, you know, um, grab the attentions from um from people and they start to you know look at your 
um, your cause and really understand what you've been doing and then you know tend to be um, donating and it works really well as well yeah and um, we also because we have our recycling machine still with us we can still operate the recycling machine and produce pendants, you know, to the pendants and shop pendants. So we have our um, ethical uh, shop online so people can, you know, purchase these pendants all over the world um, to support um, our conservation project. Um, yeah, so there are some of the efforts that we are doing, um, you know, um, currently um, in, COVID-19 but as well as you know really just um, um, looking something different to you know um, uh, making sure that we still go in this um, new normal yeah so that's it from me <laughs> over to you thank you so much Nakuya you know what I, I couldn't help as I was watching your slides uh, put mm -hmm. myself into the shoes of the kids, you know. They, you're running such a, you know, a vibrant program for kids. There's so many things, including the part I thought was fantastic, which is taking them to take up diving, right? I mean, we know yeah. uh, there's so much uh, opportunities to get involved in tourism, sustainable tourism in Perantian. And what better way to have these little kids also include, apart from academic qualifications, the ability to be involved to you know, dive, right? To be able to dive and take people diving and all that. So, so they must be missing all of this, yeah, <laughs> because of the MCO. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, but so how, how do you keep in touch with them? Uh, yeah, so it's all um, um, through um, WhatsApp group. We are very active with them. Um, I mean, because we live in Perhentian. Now I live in Kota Baru, mm -hmm. um, but we have a project house in Perhentian. So when we are basically um, in the project, uh, we know everyone and we are very close with everyone. So that's why we have like a very close relationship. We always call the students, even you know their parents, <laughs> always um, um, be connected with, uh, with the parents, even the teachers, yeah. We don't have any problems with that because we are very close. We just focus on one school. So, um, you know, like, like a kelebihan to us lah, <laughs> basically, yeah. So, so fantastic. And I can tell you, as soon as the CMCO is lifted and it's all safe to go out there, I think the kids will be racing back to get into these <laughs> programs. Yeah? yeah, I can imagine. I can, I can, we can all imagine being kids and getting so excited about all the things that, that you do. So you're very lucky, lucky children. Keep up, keep up the fantastic work. Yeah, and I'm and I hope uh, you get uh, successful in fundraising because that's gonna you know uh, be very vital to to be able to allow you to continue to do the work you do. Right. Yeah. So so thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Yeah. Okay, so, so moving on. Ah, yeah, interesting. We've got She Chua Lasalvi from Batu Batu Resort and Tengah Island Conservation. Uh, I've not met her, but I've got a little bit of write-up about her. She's the co-founder of Batu Batu Pulau Tengah and Tengah Island Conservation, opened in 2012, and she continues to oversee the company's uh, strategy and operations with a specific interest in developing conservation and sustainability initiatives. She has a particular interest in creating tourism products that support biodiversity and local communities and also advocating for tourism as a force for good. We've heard a lot about how tourism actually impacts biodiversity and so this is going to be a change. Let's, let's uh, give the floor to Shia. All yours. Thanks, Dr. Dino. Share the screen here, please. Okay, so Dr. Dino has already introduced me, um, so I don't know, don't need to do that again. Um, I'm going to quickly talk as instructed um, about the projects, um, how COVID has impacted them, and how we see the way forward. So a little bit first about Batu Batu, I think I am um, perhaps a little bit different from your usual speakers. I've been listening in over the last um, couple of days. Uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a conservation biologist. In fact, I'm not a scientist at all. Um, it all started with um, the founding of Batu Batu in 2012. So what is Batu Batu? Batu Batu is a 22-villa um, a resort on an island in Pulau Tengah, 
uh, Kulatunga is 16 kilometers off the coast of Mersing. Um, and it's a little island that's three kilometers round. It has no community on it. Um, and it's within the Johor Marine Park. So it's one of the gazetted islands. Um, we, at the resort, we strongly believe um, that private sector tourism can act as a catalyst for positive change and positive change in terms of biodiversity as well as um, in support for local communities. Um, <laughs> we're not by any means perfect, but you know, that's, that's, that's just a guiding principle for us. Um, we do plenty of bad things like burn diesel, um, but, but, but we try our best. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years is founded um, Tunga Island Conservation. Um, and I put here Batu Batu founded and provided so that's a little glimpse into, into what we're gonna talk about um, a little bit later. We provided core funding for TIC. Um, oh, how do I? This is a, a timeline. Um, basically we start in 2012. Um, the stuff to the left is just pure interest um, on the island's history. So we opened in 2012. Um, in 2014, we, um, based on noticing that um, there were turtle nests being poached around the back of the island. We collaborated with Marine Park and the Department of Fisheries to start a hatchery um, that was to safeguard eggs. A year later, we had a couple of dive instructors who were, who were very um, keen on the project and they proposed in a meeting with Marine Park and Fisheries um, that we set up a volunteer project. And that was called Turtle Watch Camp in 2015. And that's the model that we see quite often in Malaysia where volunteers pay and then that funds a funds some of the, um, that co-funds together with the resort, some of the turtle conservation work. Um, as we started adding scientists to that team, um, that team became not just turtles, but it moved beyond turtles to, to reefs and then looking at terrestrial. Because we, we have the benefit of being on the ground and in kind of like a very complete small ecosystem. Um, so we kind of want to look at things holistically. And over time that, that, that entity has morphed into um, a standalone entity called Tunga Island Conservation. Uh, in the years between 2015 and 2019, when we set up TIC as a standalone entity with ROS, TIC just um, lived as a department within the resort. So it was like a HOD meeting, you would have head of restaurant, head of bars, um, head of m &E, and your conservation and sustainability manager who would sit around the table. Um, so a little bit of a different model from the rest and why we did it, because we believed that um, tourism, as I said before, can, can have positive impacts for tourism. Um, and we wanted to integrate tourism and conservation um, into, our, into our project. Um, TIC here, there's the mission, vision and goals. Um, I think just to, to look at the mission is to protect and preserve marine and terrestrial biodiversity through scientific research management training and outreach. And if we look at the last goal, one of the things that is really important besides the, besides the science which is ongoing is the sustainable communities, right? This idea that people thrive in harmony with nature. So TIC in numbers, um, at the beginning of this season, we had five conservation biologists on site. Um, in the last four years, the team have released 17,581 hawksbill and green turtle hatchlings. Um, they patrol on a daily basis seven islands around us covering 85 kilometers squared, or they did that up to MCO. Um, last year, they surveyed, uh, mapped, cleaned and surveyed a million square meters of coral reef and seagrass, um, removed 13.3 tons of marine debris from the ocean, and I know that there was some interest earlier on in um, ghost nets. So of that 13.3 tons last year, 50% of that was ghost nets. Um, there have been 22 deceased adult turtles found um, and not necropsies completed on the ones that were necropsyable um, in the last two years. Um, and they, the team have outreached into 508 students last year um, under a program called PADAS. So what is PADAS? PADAS is Pasukan Pendidik Ecology dan Alam Sekitar Mersing. So this program is currently a five module multi-stakeholder environmental outreach program into the schools in Mersing district. And the reason why TIC decided to um, put this in place was because we noticed ourselves included that we were all going on an ad hoc basis 
um, into schools. So some schools would get three turtle talks a year, um, some schools never heard about turtles, uh, and some schools would get six shark talks. You know, it, it was depending on which agency went in and when. So Majlis Daira Mersing helped us put this together. They've been incredibly supportive throughout. Um, and we got PPD around the table so that they could um, actually advise the group on where um, and which, which age groups and, and what parts of syllabus would be, would be meaningful for the children that we were going to speak with. So this is a program that's done with Department of Fisheries, Marine Parts, Reef Check Malaysia, Trash Hero Mersing, um, but is currently on hold. Another program that TIC have um, put in place last year was, uh, is a program called the Mersing, Mersing Multi-Stakeholder Sustainable Tourism Project, which is called MUST. Um, and this is a multi-stakeholder, it's a ground up initiative, which actually falls under the National Ecotourism Plan um, to kind of develop a five-year plan, a five-year sustainable tourism plan for Mersing. Um, and to try and kind of co-create amongst the stakeholders a tourism that has benefits for both biodiversity and um, local communities. This picture here is um, of, a, of a town hall that we held in, um, in Mersing in December. So this, this kind of thing can't happen anymore. Um, but this was a, a, um, a town hall with breakout sessions and we had 125 people um, turn up, uh, which was a pretty good show. And basically why Mersing Must? Mersing Must because um, I think a few of us in the area were a little bit concerned um, about where tourism was going to go. Um, and the fact that there were very little regulations on tourism itself. Um, so for instance, in Mersing, you could see that there were three years ago that there were no snorkel boat trips. And three years later, there are 80 snorkel boat trip um, operators, right? So now really was the time before it became unmanageable to, to engage with those, those communities um, and to try and build together a, a, a tourism that was, that was a little bit more conscious. Um, the vision perfect, we wrote this, why Mersing must, the vision perfect is that um, must helps preserve paradise because it is still is a paradise for the benefit of future generations. And then finally, this um, might ask Kaka to a guest house coffee shop and community space, why this is anything to do with turtles on a turtle panel. Um, and it's because um, turtles are probably the reason behind this project. So it's a tourism supporting local communities project. Um, it hasn't got off the ground yet. It's ready to open, but MCO happened. So we haven't opened it yet. Um, it's a boutique guest house and coffee shop that tourists can drop into. Do you know that Mersing Islands, um, Tioman included, see around 500,000 tourists a year. Uh, the people literally arrive in Mersing town, jump on a boat and get out to the islands. The town itself sees very little benefit of, um, of the passing tourism trade. So we wanted to create a space where people could come and find out a little bit more about um, experiences guided tours, community-led tourism activities. And we also wanted to create a community space where we could co-create community products with um, local communities uh, that, that, local, that tourists coming through would actually stop by and spend a little bit of money. And why, why this has got anything to do with turtles? Um, it's because it came about as we were scratching our heads on, on how ownership is created. Right, how responsibility amongst communities. Actually, someone in government turned to us one day and said, you really think you can create ownership? You know, so that was the challenge. The gauntlet was thrown down and we said, okay, let's, let's try this, right? If we can engage meaningfully with local communities, um, we start creating with them projects where they see income coming in. And then there are interactions with tourists where they understand why tourists travel to this area maybe we can, we can create um, a sense of ownership, understanding responsibility for the, for the natural environment. So impacts of COVID-19, those are the projects. Now we're looking at impacts of COVID-19 and I'm looking at it as first impacts on the resort as a business owner and then impacts on the conservation projects. 
um, first as a resort owner, the resort closed on 18th of March. Now that's enormous for us on the East Coast because it's the beginning of the high season. We've just come out of monsoon. The whole East Coast has been in hibernation. March is like school holidays, Malaysia, international school holidays, Easter. You're expecting 90% occupancy up till October. That's the time where you make your money and it's all gone to zero, right? So you imagine how many businesses along that area, along our coast are suffering. It's, 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 it's horrible. Um, I mean, you see a drop of revenues to zero overnight. When we were planning for COVID, we saw it coming and we were saying, okay, so less people will travel, let's budget, let's run a 50% of budget scenario, let's send a 40% of budget scenario. Let's, and then it just blindsided us, zero, right? So, um, and I think the thing with tourism businesses as well, you're also processing a large number of refunds because people cancel their trips. So you need to send money out of the business as well. Um, so the first part of COVID-19, um, and this is the case for tourism, it's the case for any, any business that's been impacted, right? Businesses, NGOs, it's firefighting, it's emergency planning, um, it's consultations with staff because you can no longer pay. Um, the resort, I, I, and, and as I said, if COVID had happened in November, it would have been completely different, a completely different story because we're already um, with our resources to, to go through a hibernation period for a few months. So the resort moves into hibernation, all the costs are cut and basically you're on survival mode. Um, and survival mode means you can't cost, unfortunately for a resort, we can't cut costs to zero because um, we have overheads that we have to pay. So the difficulty, and I'm sure everyone is facing this, is that there's very little visibility, right? So that's, so the thing with scenario planning is people plan for scenarios and you, the thing is, you, you plan a scenario, then you throw it away. You know, as soon as the next announcement is made or as soon as you see the numbers come. So what, how does that impact on the conservation projects? Well, it was terrible timing as well. Um, we had created Tinga Island, Tinga Island Conservation to be a standalone ROS um, and to be independent of the resort, but we had not got there yet. So we had just opened our bank account after a lot of pain. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was more or less empty. So at the moment, we don't have funding for the, for the Tinga Island conservation scientists, um, or the consultants we were working with, and we were funding to start up the Kakatua community projects. Um, our scientists are currently unpaid. Um, there is some work ongoing because three of the five scientists are still on the island, um, and are actually volunteering very kindly their time. And Tanya, who program manages the project, is um, one of the organizers for this in the working group for this um, event. But the arrangement is not sustainable. We can not not pay people for a long amount of time. Um, so what do we do? We've been scratching our heads. Um, the first thing is decoupling the reliance of Tengai Island Conservation on Batu Batu. Um, and I think in general, we've seen there's been a huge reliance of um, uh, on tourism of conservation projects. You see it around the world, right? Um, so there's a lot of thinking around that, around resilience. Um, short term, you know, others are doing similar crowdfunding. We've got a guest database. We can contact people. People have seen the work that Tung Island Conservation have done. Hopefully they will um, support it. Uh, we can sell merchandise. We can provide online education. Um, and then what else? I think we need to actively look for opportunities, right? We have to sit around and really think about where is there a need? Um, where can TIC's expertise bring value in this particular crisis and this time of need? Um, and something we know is that tourism dependent communities have suffered very badly. Um, and how does this link to biodiversity? It links because this may result in activities that cre create increased environmental damage. I think there's been a lot of talk in the tourism world about, oh, well, in the echo chamber that is probably my tourism world, which is the sustainable tourism um, space, people talk about this pause, people talk about the great things, people talk about the dolphins in Venice. And, um, but we're also wondering about the people who have no livelihoods, 
um, and what tourism will look like when it reopens. Will people just do anything, undercut each other, go anywhere, take more people, just anything to bring in the money? Um, and also, um, are people going to, to resort to, to taking eggs or taking coral species or um, to, to augment revenue sources, right, which are just not coming in? So where we've landed is we see that COVID-19 tourism recovery planning um, could be central for us because we're in a specific space for fundraising. Um, and this could be a precursor um, to a wider sustainable tourism plan, which we're already, we're one year into looking at as a, as a mixed stakeholder group in the Mersing area. So we look at this time, um, which has been pretty horrific for everyone um, as, a, as an opportunity, right? And a, an opportunity, we never have time usually when things are going on. So, so now we have some time to pause and plan the way forward. Um, and one thing, I, if I can ask anyone listening, if they could look at the Tunga Island Conservation Instagram page, there's a travel tomorrow survey on there. Um, one of the things, if you could just take a minute to, to answer it and maybe share it, um, we're trying to get some information which we will happily share with anyone who needs it and who wants it. We're trying to understand how people feel about traveling um, and, and where, their, where their concerns and priorities lie. And we're trying to see whether there are any um, patterns that emerge in terms of socioeconomic group and where people live and where they come from. Um, so we're also trying, I've seen some amazing things in all the projects over the last couple of days um, of engaging local communities and protecting biodiversity. So we'd like to do more of that in the area. There isn't, there isn't a lot going on um, and more citizen science and nature tourism. I think there's a, I think there's a demand from tourists for more um, experiential, more transformational experiences. Again, we're going back to tourism. So we also need to look at resilience, right? Resilience, how, how do we make communities who are reliant on tourism and conservation projects that rely on tourism more resilient? And so we're really brainstorming around not just COVID-19 threats, but other climate change um, threats and looking at how we can diversify revenues. How do we bring revenue to an area when tourists can't come? Um, when all that area is, someone, someone in town recently thought that 70% of businesses in Mersing are negatively, like, like badly affected by the fact that tourists don't come, despite the fact that the Majlis and state government figures show that 10% of businesses in Mersing are tourism businesses. So there's that supply chain, right? Which makes it so, so impactful now. Um, so we're looking at recovery planning, recovery planning, um, which means recovery planning for the now. So when tourism reopens, how does it reopen safely? Because the last thing you want to happen is for tourism to reopen, the money's to start flowing again, everything to restart. And then, oops, the tourists, it's not properly managed. The tourists bring COVID, it becomes a, an, an enhanced MCO area and then we're back to square square one, square zero. Um, then we're looking at engaging, upskilling, value adding, planning together and reducing economic leakage. Um, and I think we're, we're, still, we're still writing frameworks for recovery planning and seeing who um, finds it valuable and who wants to fund it. So, so we're, we're still early on in the path. Um, but I think it's been really important and we've really seen that it's, it's really important right now to be working with all the different stakeholders because everyone's perspectives are so important. So that's government, that's private sector, that's local community, that's NGOs, that's kind of getting everyone around the table and planning this out together because we're in this together. One person, one part of that chain needs to slip and then we're all, we're all back in it. So I wondered if I had time to play a quick video and finish there. Just one minute. Yes, sure, you have about a minute or two. Great. So, so this is just a video that I wanted to play. Um, if I can share the screen. Which just shows, um, gives everyone a bit of relief. You don't have to listen to me anymore, but it's also um, allows everyone to look 
at one of the community things that we did recently. And also it's of interest because um, you get to see the ghost nets, the number of ghost nets that we pulled from the sea. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think on again, behalf of all of us, uh, thank you to Batu Batu Resort for investing and in setting up the Tengah Island Conservation. And I think the, the thing that probably worries a lot of us is when you mentioned about decoupling uh, the funding flows into the conservation project. Yeah? Uh, but I think this is a nice example of uh, sustainable tourism, where it's not just about people coming in, to enjoy nature and beauty, but also uh, ensuring that their impact is minimized, but also they have a net positive impact on, on, on the islands and, and the surrounding environment. So I, I can only wish you success in, in moving forward because um, we're all in this, we're all in the same boat in terms of the amount of unexpected things that we'll, we will have to face when the MCO is lifted and we are able to go back to our, our routines, our normality of life, if at all, there's a chance to go back to some sense of normalcy, but uh, money, money for conservation. So trying to find ways to ensure conservation work on the ground can be self-financing. has never been an easy one for all of us in the field of conservation, but the moment we can find ways so that there's an income stream that works its way to self-fund conservation, you know, anyone that can crack the quote on that should get a Nobel Prize, right? Uh, so, so again, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for the work you do and we wish you all the best. And I'd like to see, and I'll personally keep track of this project because it can be a model of how something that was set up because of a crisis had to rethink its strategy on financing and hopefully can move towards self-financing. And it'll be a great model to tell and others can learn from. So thank you once again. You're welcome. So let's move on. Um, We've got the next panelist, who is uh, Liana Izwin Khalid. Uh, she's currently the conservation officer at the Marine Research Foundation. Um, and uh, she is uh, based in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. Her key role is coordinating the foundation's flagship program, the Turtle Excluder Device Program in Malaysia, TDs as we, as we know, which aims to reduce the incidental catch of endangered sea turtles in shrimp fisheries. So over to you. Let's hear your story. Thank you, Dr. Gina. Okay.
Right, hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Dino again. And Assalamualaikum and hello, everyone. Uh, Selamat Hari Raya Ideal Fitri. Uh, I hope you guys are safe at home or at work like I am. <laughs> so um, let me introduce a bit about myself. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Dino has already introduced me a bit. So my name is Liana. Um, I have a background in marine science. Uh, basically, I have a bachelor's in uh, marine science from the University of um, Kebangsaan in Malaysia, UKM. And then I did my master's in oceanography at the Southampton University in United Kingdom. So right now, um, I'm attached to the Marine Research Foundation. And I'm very happy to be one of the panelists for today. Uh, so to start a little bit, um, I'll, I'll talk about MRF. So from our name itself, you've already probably guessed what we do. So we are a foundation or a, we call it a an NGO or non-profit um, organization. Um, and we are based in Kota Kinabalu. So we were established in 2004. Um, so what we, our work um, includes uh, marine, marine conservation uh, projects and education activities so that um, uh, we, to, to further understand the marine ecosystem and its functions. So basically our work uh, provides management oriented solutions for government agencies and uh, fellow conservationists. So um, in MRF, um, I am a conservation officer and alongside two of my colleagues, Jonathan and Casey. And then we have, of course, Dr. Nick Pilcher, our executive director and um, our mentor, our guru. <laughs> And then um, we have Common Pilcher, our um, office manager. So, um, okay, so what do we do? So I'll talk about a bit about some of the projects that uh, I was, I, I have been involved in. And there's a lot of other projects that, um, that I might not share here because of the time that we have. Uh, so basically, uh, before I go on, I just want to warn you guys, there's a lot of colorful photos ahead. So uh, stay, be, be seated down. Uh, don't go to the beach just yet or don't go, don't go to the ocean just yet. Uh, so one of the activities or projects run by MRF is of course the, our flagship project, the Turtle Excluder Device, or we call it TATS Malaysia. So, um, this program has been going on since 2007 and it's fully supported by the Department of Fisheries Malaysia. And um, so my key role is the project coordinator. So where, where I oversee the, all the, the implementation of this program. And um, uh, th these are some of the key milestones of um, the last few years. And you can see that since 2017, the East Coast um, Peninsula Malaysia, uh, trawl fishers are required to use TEDs during the monsoon season. So Klantan, Tragano, Pahang and Johor are already required to use TEDs on their boats. And um, this is how the TED looks like, one of the TED. Um, so it's a simple grid um, where we have vertical bars so that um, their fish, their catch, their fish, their shrimps go past through it and until the cod end. And then while large objects and turtles um, are forced through an opening flat around here. So these are short uh, video of how the turtle escaped from the TED. So basically the objective of this project is to minimize um, the accidental catch of these uh, sea turtles by using a TED without impacting the livelihood of our um, local fishing communities. So we have also um, developed a uh, TD monitoring camera system where we attach this to behind of the, um, what do you call this? Um, behind of the TD net so that we can see how they work underwater and then we can show fishermen um, what they catch and what is, was released from their, uh, from their net. So it's, it's kind of, um, uh, it shows that uh, we're helping the fishermen instead of just, oh, we're, we're trying to save turtles. Yes, we, we want to save turtles, but at the same time, we're helping the fishermen um, with their catch. Okay. 
So some of the activities that we have done or we did um, with the fishermen is um, having workshops with the fishers and also the fisheries department officers. So um, uh, we, we organize um, workshops from district to district or from states to state on the making of the TED and how they would adapt these TEDs onto their trawl nets and also train the fisheries officers in terms of enforcement, um, how they would um, check on the TED, see if the TED is installed correctly. So we train them from time to time. So um, other than the, our flagship project, there's another long-term project that we have done um, in Mantanami Island. So um, it's understanding the impacts of climate change uh, uh, at sea populations of green sea turtles. So um, maybe, I don't know if some of you have seen our videos on um, this project before. So basically the science behind this project is to um, to see the impacts of climate change and with the warming of the planet as a concern that sea turtles um, stocks will become feminized as more eggs incubate in warmer conditions. So by having a long-term data, so we are able to inform the management um, agencies on best management practices at local hatcheries and be able to see the change in trends. So, um, these are the method that we use. I don't have a video right now because it's quite long, but you can see our full video in our um, MRF uh, Facebook page. So um, we call it the turtle red rodeo method. So it's, a, it's like you jump on a moving boat and catch turtles in shallow waters. So it's kind of, um, it's fun yet um, safety is uh, surely the most important part of this project. And, um, one of the, some of the activities that we do is uh, laparoscopy where we um, perform a small surgery on the turtle to see their gender and their, um, the life stage, life stage of the turtle. And also we put cameras um, on their carpets to see their movements um, after they were released back into the water. So um, this capture mark recapture method of program is the first in Montana is the first program that um, of its kind in Southeast Asia. So other than that, we have also a partner up with Reef Check Malaysia. Um, shout out to Azmin and the team. Um, they are based in what well, they are also based in Montana. Um, and uh, we have organized um, uh, uh, education activities with the local communities, especially the school children and some of the tour guides um, that is based in on the island. So basically we just, um, we talk about our project and we answer um, total questions. So uh, whenever we are there, we try to engage with the local communities. So this is a new project that we have started also in Mantanani. Um, it's a, we started I think last year where we tried to obtain um, aerial, so, um, aerial images, top view aerial images um, in, shall, in the shallow waters of uh, Mantanani. So um, we've used um, a consumer friendly UAV um, where we uh, try to not only understand the population distribution, but also to identify the effects of um, uh, from tourism and fishing pressures on the island itself. So we also wanted to um, get the communities to be involved. So we are now trying to develop, or we, we, are, we have developed a low cost UAV, but still uh, testing out um, to get to one point, uh, at a point where the locals can try and um, try to learn to take this drone out and um, conduct their own um, aerial operations. So we don't have to go to the island like every month to, to do our work. So um, yeah, these are um, the, this is one of the areas. It's the same area where we do our turtle rodeo. It is very shallow and it's a foraging ground for sea turtles. So we fly the drone and then we do some computer work here and there and uh, we locate where the turtles are. 
So we've also done again um, engagement with the local communities where we have um, conducted questionnaires. So we interview the fishing communities and uh, especially the tourist um, tourist uh, agency, so that we are able to map out the locations of these overlap activities and, and then we were able to map the risks of, for these sea turtles. So that's a bit about what we do. So how does this pandemic um, affect the MRS operation? Um, I think while I'm under MCO, um, we had to, I mean, everyone had to stay at home. So we did a lot of um, desktop studies. We did a lot of um, pending reports and um, presentations for future workshops. So there was yes, um, zero fieldwork activities during that time, I think about a month or so. And then when CMCO started, um, I think last two weeks, we started coming to the office again. We uh, next set up all the SOPs and whatnot. <laughs> And um, yeah, we, we started coming here and settling everything, the, all the behind the scene work um, that was um, left out when we left the, the, the office. And as for our program or our projects um, for the PED program, um, so we just started a new grant from um, Yasan Saim Dabi uh, for the continuation of our PED program for the next three years and it started on the 1st of March. So you can see once we got the grant, it was just, uh, we were just pausing everything and there were no, there were plannings, uh, but there were no execution, execution in terms of having the workshops. But um, I think once we came back, uh, we were able to slowly um, plan again and um, so our projects in, um, is across Malaysia, um, Peninsula Malaysia, East Coast Peninsula Malaysia, which um, includes Kelantan, Pahang, Shungano, Johor, and Sabah, and Perak and West Johor. So, um, but we still have, um, what do you call, um, we still have the background work that we do in the office to kind of um, uh, prepare ourselves after and hopefully by the time the CMCO is lifted, then we can just go full on with the project. And as for the Mantanani work, um, of course it affected us in terms of not being able to go um, to the field. Um, but then um, in, I think, but in terms of conservation, um, it does not really affect our project. And I will tell you about this um, in a minute. Um, of course, engagement with the local communities um, in Matanini or even our uh, with the local fishermen with our TED program was just um, uh, was zero, I mean, not zero, yeah, zero in terms of like, okay, um, having to meet them and whatnot. But, and we've also um, planned for some programs in Mantanani with um, Shintai Mantanani and it was postponed. So, yeah. And um, so, how are we moving forward with? this um, uh, we've slowly um, come back to work and um, and since some of the shops have, have already opened so we kind of like okay just get all the stuff um, just buy all the stuff that we need and then we can work from the office and then we can do some of the plannings we can uh, build TEDs on, in the office so um, that's all right uh, actually and we've also um, being keeping in touch with fisheries department and also our donors to keep it keep them in the um in loop with all um, our planning um and i think for the td program um since uh, in the east coast peninsula the monsoon season starts in around november december so that's when um they use the td and for us our work in peninsula is um usually start just way before the season starts. So um, we, our plan is to come to the States and then um, train them again, like have a refreshment course with the fishermen, with um, fits in the TEDs and um, uh, uh, preparing them for the, we have the TED inspection during the monsoon season. So I hope that um, 
I mean, we had we still have some time, and I hope that we will be able to travel again to, and uh, go to the other side of um, the country. And um, I think um, we plan to instead of having like big workshops like we always do, um, we start in the, uh, we work in a small scale like we have probably many trials with uh, fishermen, maybe just one or two boats at one time. So it limits um, the number of people that we interact with, but we do it multiple times instead of just one big workshop. So that is one of our um, plan B, I can, I, uh, perhaps I can say it's a plan B. And um, this is some of the work that uh, my team and I uh, will be um, are doing in the office. So we built uh, 3D and we have some uh, 3D printers that we uh, print our uh, camera system equipments and um, materials. So as for the Mantanani research, um, usually when we do the Turtle Rodeo project, um, we it's a long-term project. So we usually um, travel or we we conduct two or three trips per year, like spread over the year. So um, uh, we've conducted one trip in um, February this year. So we are planning to do another one probably in June. Let's hope that if this, um, if the CMCO is lifted, then we will just, let's go. So um, we will have, um, and our days are flexible. So it's not like, we have, uh, we, we, okay, we really have to go in June and we can't change it to Je um, July after that. So it's pretty flexible because it's a seasonal variation um, project. So um, yeah, and we usually will be on the board of um, with five or six of us. So I'm sh pretty sure that we will have some uh, social distancing on board. <laughs> um, so I'll just show you a bit of um, some graphs, some simple graphs to show um, how and why we are moving forward with this project, even in this time around and um, uh, until today. So this graph, um, if you can see, um, shows the proportion of um, new turtles, the one in red, it's my mouse, okay, with, with, with the one in red, alongside with the total number of um, turtles that we catch um, annually. So at one year, we have, uh, we went for two to three trips per year. So if you can see in 2010, there was a bit of um, decline. This is because of the um, uh, poaching of turtles from the Vietnamese and the Chinese um, vessels. So there's a bit of um, yeah decline here, but um, we are, and then we slowly see uh, increasing in numbers of turtles that we catch, but it's a bit worrying that um, there's a decline in the numbers of um, new turtles actually. And for 2020 is only by a trip. So we can't really see this yet. And this graph shows the proportion of female turtles encountered per year. So if you see from when we started this project, there was um, a high uh, number of uh, proportion of female turtles caught about 89%. But then over the years, it has gradually uh, decreasing at about, I think 66, 67%. But again, this is just for one trip. So, but we, st we still see the, the indicative trend since the management uh, efforts has changed in the local hatcheries. So we have also collected some um, tissue samples, about 160 plus um, tissue samples, um, completed the genetic analysis, and we found out that um, from the preliminary results that the large sample um, indicated that turtles come from Sarawak, from Tipa, um, the South Peninsula Malaysia, Sipadan, Vietnam, and North Peninsula Malaysia. So from all this work that um, we have done and the analysis that we did during the MCO. So um, I think it provides a long story on the foraging ground um, of the turtle population structure in Sabah waters. And this will help with the cont um, contribute to the uh, literature of our, the impacts of climate change in, um, on sea turtles. So 
um, as for our drone project, um, it is, um, it's also a pause as in we can't go to Wantanani um, at the moment to collect the, we have a, usually a monthly data. So um, we stopped, uh, I think for two months, we couldn't go in March, uh, April and May or March and April, I think. Um, um, however, because it's to understand the seasonal distribution, it does not really give an impact on the analysis that much. And um, I think our team member, Jonathan, will probably um, head off to Mantanani uh, once this is, or, or I think he plans to. Um, well, it depends on how it goes um, to go to Mantanani and do his survey. And um, yeah, in the meantime, we're just building up and testing our drone. Um, this is an old photo, so we're not really outside. Uh, we're just in, in, in the office and fixing and building the um, drone. And um, yeah, for education, I think um, we have jumped on the Facebook bandwagon uh, finally after so long. Um, we try to, um, we have our official Facebook now uh, with Marine Research Foundation. And um, uh, yeah, we started this to um, share our projects uh, with our peers and our um, and the public. And um, since we figured that we couldn't share our work uh, face to face now, so might as well do it virtually. So we've had a lot of amazing support and feedbacks from people. People are sharing our work. Our um, we have a lot of likes, <laughs> and um, yeah. Um, and we could reach the bigger audience than before, which is interesting and surprisingly great. And um, so, yeah, if you haven't followed us yet, uh, please do so, Marine Research Foundation. And um, uh, in terms of fundraising, we haven't, I mean, we tried to apply like, for our um, future projects with fundings and whatnot um, online, but then for a while, we just stopped um, just to let this COVID pass through first and see how it goes from there. So yeah, uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Liana. That was like right spot on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you know, I'm I'm very impressed by the, by the work uh, that Nick uh, set up to the Marine Research Foundation. Yeah. The work that you do with your team, especially on the TEDs. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep the questions all to the end, uh, plus adding on the ones that are coming up, popping up uh, from our viewers. Okay. But I want to quickly go on to uh, Dr. Uzai Rusli from the Sea Turtle Research Unit, uh, University of Malaysia, Trondano. Dr. Uzai is a biologist interested in the physiology and behavior of the Kilonian species. His current interest is in investigating behavior and energetic costs of nest escape by turtle hatchlings, something that we don't quite hear often enough. He is the team leader of the Sea Turtle Research Unit, CTRU, at the Institute of Oceanography and Environment, University of Malaysia, Trungano. So, Dr. Jose, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dino, and uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. A very good afternoon to everyone. Selamat Hari Raya. I am wearing uh, baju Melayu today, uh, still on the Hari Raya spirit. Okay, so before I move further, I would like to acknowledge um, our uh, previous team leader for the Sea Turtle Research Unit. I know you are here, Professor Chan and Heng. <laughs> I read your comments over here and uh, it is really, really touching for me because um, let me read this one. Um, Prof Chan uh, wrote, I feel so proud listening to all our young turtle conservationists speaking in these stations. So uh, what we had yesterday, um, we have a line of uh, legend, which is, I call the legend for the sea turtle conservation in Malaysia because most of them, I would say all of them is a pioneer for the sea turtle research, including you, Datuk Dino. <laughs> and also uh, Dr. Juanita Joseph uh, as well, the, the second team leader for the sea turtle research unit. And then, um, this is actually, um, we are the young uh, conservationists, young biologists uh, working on the, on the ground right, right now. We are uh, just like, I want to read this one, um, Malay Rhyme, which is um, Buah cepedak di luar pagar, ambil galah tolong jolokkan, kami semua budak baru belajar, 
Kalau salah tolong tunjuk tunjukkan. Okay, so by that um, I would I would say we are the the, the young uh, conservationists working because um, uh, we are not really um, uh, it's not really hard compared to the previous time because of uh, they already paved uh, the way for us uh, and then and now we are really facing the the challenge that nobody think about this one is going to be happen for for this pandemic and. Uh, uh, I would say um, I am very, very lucky because I am in the university, not um, not from the NGO uh, compared to compared to the others NGO. Okay, so uh, let me start to introduce uh, the C Turtle Research Unit from uh, University of Malaysia Terengganu. So we are under the Institute of Oceanography and Environment. So uh, I would say that uh, we are the uh, just like the research wing for the government. So we are um, helping out the Department of Fisheries, especially for, for this uh, sea turtle conservation because they are the main stakeholders for, for this sea turtle conservation throughout uh, Malaysia. So we are helping out them. So to do the conservation, we need a, a very strong, uh, in terms of the evidence base. So that's why most of our work it is involved with the scientific research. Okay, so as the Higher Institution Center of Excellence, INOS at uh, University of Malaysia Terengganu, we have uh, one uh, small sanctuary at uh, Redang Island. So this work has been started in 1993. That time, uh, uh, Terengganu State gazetted this area as the turtle sanctuary. So from that particular area, we focus our work over there. We generate new knowledge and, and uh, of course, for the sake of the sea turtle conservation, and then, um, then we can spread the knowledge and then we can share so that we can do um, the conservation works. So in order to, to do our work, we have our, our team here, which is we would like to nurturing turtles at our research station and also around Malaysia area and also beyond our, our territory as well by connecting people. So we would say this one because uh, we like to make friends, we like to connect with other people because we know this conservation work, it must be inclusive. We cannot leave anyone behind, especially in this pandemic. We know that after this, I will uh, share about our concern about um, possibly one of the small uh, group that we might left them behind. So we really need to concern about this one. So in uh, University of Malaysia Terengganu, we do offer for the student internship. So this is not only for the University of Malaysia Terengganu students, but we offer from all around the globe for every university students. As long as they registered as the university students, they are entitled to uh, to join our student internship program for free. Why for free? Because we have a very good sustainable uh, project has been introduced at our research station back in 1998 until now. So from the money that we generate that one, so we would like to give it back to the society. So this is the way we are giving back. We are offering the student internship program for free. Okay, so for the research collaboration, yes, we do want to share our result. I know that I am a, a very, uh, just started um, as the professional uh, biologist. So I cannot do anything because in order to do the conservation, this is about to understand, not only understand the sea turtle, this is also about to understand people that related to the sea turtle in their daily life. So the idea is now that we want to open up our research stations and also share our facilities and we can collaborate regardless of your university, wherever you are coming from, we are um, uh, welcoming you with our open heart. And also for the corporate partnership. So the idea of having a close contact with the corporate partnership back in 2018, that time when I just appointed by uh, University of Malaysia Trenganu, to lead this uh, CTATA research unit. And then um, the UMT management uh, sent one of the group uh, from the UMT management, we call it the risk um, uh, assessment, uh, uh, the risk management uh, assessment team. 
So what what they they did for us that uh, they are assessing all those the risk for our project. For for example, right now we have a problem with the our uh, outreach program. Okay, so previously we are running our sea turtle volunteer program. And from that one, we can generate money so that we can sustain our research station. And from that 2018, we realized that what happened if we cannot run our volunteer program? So from that one, we try to make contact with the corporate partners and Alhamdulillah, I would say from that particular concern from our management team, we start seeking out alternative. So we are preparing. On that time, we are not, not we have no idea about this pandemic is going to be happen. So Alhamdulillah, um, I would say I am very lucky because I have uh, full support from the university. Okay, so what we are, what I'm going to share with you guys right now is about um, it's time for us to make friends and then we learn lots of things because uh, I know that if I am alone, if I didn't get support from the management because I'm just a typical biologist working on my work on the animal physiology, so I know I will be in a very big trouble right now. But Alhamdulillah, I got support from, uh, um, let me mention uh, some of them, Yasan Bank Rakyat and Yasan Bank Rakyat also supporting me. I know supporting uh, uh, Turtle Conservation Society. And then um, I got support from Bernama, KPMG every year, sending off their volunteers to our research station. And we have Bajaya groups and the Taras offering us for the lab. Uh, FNN, Laguna, Laguna, this is um, our good friends in uh, Redang helping out us for transporting our uh, volunteers to the Redang Island. And uh, of course, uh, the main stakeholders here, Jawatan Perikanan. So we are working closely with them. Okay. And uh, the latest one we have uh, from MMS. So I know MMS also um, uh, uh, supporting the uh, uh, reef uh, project as well. So because of this is the big company, they are actually looking for the uh, conservation project in order to get, um, I'm not sure about this, this, this term, uh, which is they, they call it, it's uh, some, some sort of like the, the green metric for their company. Okay, so this is the win-win situation where we can share our facilities, they can come and uh, join us and then they also can get uh, credit by uh, sponsor us and also we can move forward together. And uh, of course, for our scientific collaboration, we did collaboration with the National Museum of Marine Biology and Aquarium in Taiwan. And now we have a project about assessing our sea turtle health uh, in the South China Sea because they said they found a lot of the sea turtle in waters in Taiwan, but unfortunately, they cannot access the wild nesting turtles. And from the previous uh, studies, they found that almost half of the turtle found stranded at Taiwan Strait, they are coming from Malaysia. So that's the reason of they are coming here. And then we, uh, we had sent our students over there uh, to conduct training uh, together with them. So for the UPM, we are working with the uh, veterinary, uh, veterinary uh, faculty. And then we, um, right now we have a lot of uh, uh, various projects that I will mention to you guys later. So this is our three uh, foundational commitments. Number one, of course, because we are from the university, we concentrate on the science. So from the science that we are generating knowledge and then we want to do the conservation with this evidence that, that we found it. And of course, we want to share the knowledge and then we don't want to leave the community behind. So these three things that I will share about the impact that we had uh, after this about the scientific, I would say um, not much uh, impact because I would say for the scientific things, doing research, we are more focused right now. Why? Because we cannot start with the new project. We must finish with what we had previously, finish the data, finish right up and finish the report and submit it to make it publish and then share with everyone. Because I know if we are free right now, 
still can go to the field, you know, for the researchers, normally they are very eager to go to the field and collecting data. And now it's a free time for everyone. Sit down on your desk, concentrate, finish up the manuscript and share it to everyone. So I would say this is very, very, very positive things for the scientific community. Okay, so for the number two, for the conservation previously, I, uh, I said our conservation project has been supported by our volunteer program. And previously, uh, we already conduct our risk assessment. And now I would say we are prepared for that one because of most of our monthly overhead is already reduced for since 2019. And now when we are accounted this problem, we are not really affected. So we are just reduce the activities at the research station. And now we are at the minimal operation at this moment. But for the sea turtle nesting monitoring, it is still 100% ongoing since the very first MCO has been introduced to our country in the, uh, on the 18th March, if I'm not mistaken. And right now we have about 500 nesting uh, until last week because I cannot contact them uh, in the daily basis because we have a limited connection with them. So Alhamdulillah, uh, during Hari Raya, normally pre uh, from the previous years, we had uh, Professor Chan and also uh, we had uh, Mr. Liu Hock Cha to back up our, our staff over there because most of us celebrating Hari Raya. So we are very lucky because we have our founder uh, still actively advising us and also still actively uh, supporting us. But uh, unfortunately, this year, Professor Chan and Mr. Lee Hock Cha, they cannot come to our research station. So hopefully, uh, after this one finish, and then we can uh, bring Prof Chan again, because this is just like the annual visit uh, by uh, Professor Chan and also some of uh, her good friend coming to our research station. So for the community, Previously, we have lots of uh, different activities, some sort of uh, like the citadel the release. Uh, it is involved with the uh, local uh, local people from the Red Duck Island and also the tourists at the Long Beach of uh, Laguna. So for this one, we just go into online. But our concern right now, this is about we cannot reach everyone because we have limited uh, uh, access because some of our community, especially our coastal communities, they are, we know that they are, have a, a very, very limited device and also the internet connection. So our concern is about the digital poverty. So I want to throw out the uh, concern uh, right now because uh, since yesterday, we share a lot of the live stream webinar happening, and then we are talking about sea turtle raise up the awareness. But we need to accept the fact that at least forty percent of our community right now they are under the digital poverty. They do not have access. And then, what happened if this pandemic is still ongoing until end of this year? So we will say that throughout this 2020, this community will be left behind, okay? So that's the reason why right now, our team very vocal, especially on the social media, we talk about the open selling of the sea turtle eggs. So this is happening on the ground right now because of MCO, not many enforcement can be conducted and then also people, the older generation, they are just like the craving of the having the sea turtle eggs. And then the younger generation that they are not really eating the sea turtle eggs. They are not really consuming the sea turtle eggs. But unfortunately, they are thinking that this is another uh, things that they can make money. So they are selling through online, through Facebook, through Shopee. And then Alhamdulillah, when we gather uh, all these boys, uh, through the Society for Conservation Biology, we can raise this issue nationally. So this one has been picked up by media. So thanks to Bernama, thanks to AFP, thanks to NST. So a lot of different media catching up this one. So now we want to still 
preaching about the sea turtle egg consumption, we must stop it, especially for the Trungganu people. Okay, so that's the thing that we really, really concerned about the uh, community at this moment during this pandemic. So let me uh, share about our 2019 conservation data summary. So at our Chagahutan research station. So this Chagahutan research station is only about 350 meters long, but we host about 1,005 nests. Uh, in 2019, we have the highest nesting number, which is 1,005. So until this, uh, until last week, we had uh, about 500 uh, nesting. So we are expecting this year we can have about 1,002 or 1,003. So we are not sure because of the sea turtle uh, nesting activity, it is fluctuating. Okay, so for the eggs, uh, 151,000 eggs and then the hatching success in average, we, we can get about 81%. So this one is uh, slightly um, we would say this one is uh, pretty good, can be accepted because of we are running the in situ, most of our um, nesting activities uh, uh, happening on the natural beach. And then we try our best to not moving this natural nest so that we can achieve 81% in average. Okay. So for the outreach program, so this is the one that I shared to you that um, um, we cannot start this one because normally we will start our uh, outreach program for the sea turtle volunteer in uh, middle of April until uh, end of September. So in one week, we're going to receive 10 group of volunteers. So it is open volunteers, not for the university students. Okay, so for the public, they need to pay 800 ringgit and for the students, it is 500 ringgit. So from this one, uh, this is the way how we sustain our, our, our project. So we are not really concerned about, uh, about this program because another uh, commitment, which is the scientific things and also for the outreach, it is still can happen it. because of course we cannot get money from this one in order to do the research uh, activities because of course the research activities need a lot of uh, money and then uh, alhamdulillah the university of malaysia Trigano already allocated half million ringgit for us to run the multidisciplinary research so the multidisciplinary research this is about how we conduct the research not only for the biology because previously um, we knew that most of the uh, um, sea turtle research unit are focused on the applied biology because uh, all of us, the team leader previously, Professor Chan, uh, Dr. Juanita Joseph, they are biologists as well. So at this moment, we try to approach all different uh, discipline, all different experts in University of Malaysia Trigano and also all around Malaysia. So we open up this platform for them to join us. So for example, for the information and technology, we are uh, uh, still developing the algorithm for the photo ID, because right now we only rely on the internal tech. Okay, so, and then uh, we are at this moment, uh, our team uh, developing the cloud database system so that we can share our data. So not only for the scientists at University of Mission Trungganu, possibly Dato Dino, if you are, have free time and then you can access our database and possibly it, it can give you any idea about the research and then you can share it and then we can do uh, with the collaboration. So that's uh, not only rely on the, a few expert working on the sea turtles because we need to share the data. So we need ideas, okay? So for the biology, of course, we are doing for the nesting ecology, hatchings dispersal. So this is hatchings dispersal. We incorporated the uh, ocean model. So at our Institute of Oceanography, we have an uh, expert working on the ocean model, which is forecasting about the ocean uh, environment, the current behavior, and then we want to predict where about our sea turtle when they left the, their nesting ground. And then we want to map the highly uh, priority conservation area for especially for the sea turtle hatching. I know this is really, really challenging and people previously working on the 
uh, see total hatchlings, and then uh, this is quite challenging. And then uh, in order to do this, uh, we get a lot of uh, support from Malaysia and also uh, from uh, the University of Queensland. And right now we are working uh, also for the predation rate of the sea turtle hatchlings when they are leaving our nesting beach. And then uh, right now at in front of our beach, I would say about 40% of them we will get predicted, 40%. Okay. So and say then, I don't want to disturb yes. you, but uh, you've already spilled over time. So maybe if you try and uh, speed up a bit, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah. And, and then uh, for the human ecology, we, uh, at this moment, we want to, um, how are we going to uh, improve our outreach program and, and another one uh, about the mathematics and also for the socioeconomy because previously uh, people talking about the uh, biology of the sea turtles and now we want to see the, the impact of having conservation on the sea turtles. Okay, so uh, all of the research, uh, it is actually, uh, we refer on the National Plan of Action for conservation and the management of the sea turtles. So I guess uh, that's all from me. Sorry, taking too long. <laughs> no, not a worry at all. I, I, I'm quite familiar with the work of uh, See True uh, because of the, the work started by Prof Chan and Liu Hong Chan. But you know what I like to do personally? I like to sit down and listen to a full lecture by you, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, come up to speed. And I'm sure our listeners as well come up to speed with what C2 is up to these days. I'm, honestly, I'm a bit out of touch. Uh, and I, from just your presentation, I know there's a lot that's uh, moved on since the earlier days. Yeah? So I must find some time to sit down with you and listen to uh, uh, you know, a, a full 45-minute presentation, maybe, you know, something like that. <laughs> okay, so um, we have... Uh, so once again, thank you, Dr. Jose, for the fantastic presentation on, on the work you do. We've got some questions and I'm going to post them to the respective panelists. So uh, get ready your microphone, make sure it's on when you're answering the question. The first question is to Alia. Uh, it's from uh, Samsha Shida uh, Samshol. She says, during this COVID-19 pandemic, how does it affect the local community's economy, especially the women's society? How can we help as members of the public? So this is for Alia. All right. Um, thank you, Sham, for the excellent question. Um, okay, so the reason why we initiated this um, women empowerment program is basically to help out the women community. So they are full-time housewives that depend 100% on the income from their husbands. So their husbands um, usually does uh, odd jobs. And since MCO is implemented, ha, 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 they can't go out, can't do anything. So... Um, part of their income is, of course, highly affected. And um, when they actually joined um, our initiative, it, the women actually had the opportunity to uh, gain their own income. So from the sales of products, of course, it's not only uh, benefiting us in terms of um, awareness, because you know when people uh, use your products, they wear your products. So um, you get more awareness out of it. But then the, also that the local women are getting some incomes as well. So I would say um, if you guys out there who is, you know, you want to help these, um, these women, um, of course, you should uh, help support their uh, effort. Um, um, buy, buy some of our products, uh, our handmade products that they had. Actually, yeah, their handwork is amazing. Honestly, um, it, you can compare them to the things that you bought in, in KL. It, it's, it's the same level. So that is very impressive. So that's just one of the things that you can do for them. Yeah. I hope that answers cool. your question, Sham. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Sham has got uh, you know, uh, a question for Shia. So she says, what are the challenges you face regarding must? And does it involve any governmental departments to make it a reality? If so, what are their reaction? Okay, so the first, um, yes, yes, must couldn't happen without government. Um, it, it involves um, very heavily Majlis Daira, Mersing, hmm. um, and then MOTAC, uh, Ministry of Tourism, Agriculture, um, the fisheries department who um, 
at local level are very involved as well. Um, so, and state government. So we've had a little bit of funding from us that's come in from, mm. from MOTAC and state government to make it happen. Uh, yeah, so for sure it wouldn't have, um, it wouldn't have flown without government buy-in and, and otherwise we'd just be a group of interested people sitting around a table and being idealistic, right? Um, <laughs> so so uh, challenges, um, I think challenges, I think we've been actually very lucky. Um, we spotted someone in government who was looking interested and who was looking like he was gonna buy into this. So, so we, just, we just went for it. Um, I think one of the things we did as well was we tied it to government plans that are out there, like the National Biodiversity, National Biodiversity Plan and the National Ecotourism Plan, so that it, it's, it's posted as a win-win thing. Um, I think the other thing is we approach it, um, which is a challenge and a not challenge. We've um, been out there as a private business um, putting this forward. So when MOTAC get it, they're like, oh, it's one of our tourism people suggesting this. It's not like, oh, we're being nagged by an NGO. So it depends which hat um, you, I get to wear on any particular day, um, which maybe helps. But that's also one of the challenges, right? Because in multi-stakeholder, when you're a private business, um, people, everyone wonders about your, your incentives um, and your motivations. Um, so, so that's that's a challenging one as well. But I think the way around that is to put as many people around the table as possible, yeah. and to slowly buy trust. Yeah. We got a another question in for you, Sher, but this comes from Prof Chan. I was thinking about this as well. So, regarding the twenty-two turtle strandings mm. you mentioned, uh, what's the cause of that? A certain do you, do you know the cause of death? So, the cause of death is ascertained when they're not too degraded to be able to necropsy, right? And then sometimes they, they necropsy them and they can't find what's wrong. So it's either been boat strikes, which is more common. We think boat strikes because there are injuries to um, like propeller style or, or shock injuries. Um, there's been a little bit of plastic ingestion found and then there's been a whole swathe of, we're not quite sure. But we also know that there are some ghost net um, tie-ups, right? None, none that our team have found in the last couple of years, but I know that Trash Hero Mersing called Bomba the other day, about a year ago, because there was a turtle, they, they actually managed to release it, but it was so wrapped up in ghost net that Bomba had to come and, and, and undo it all. I think the video is on YouTube somewhere, so you'll find it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I think the um, uh, Barina from Marine Parks was telling me the other day that she saw a ghost net with three drowned turtles all stuck on it. So and where our populations are not very large, that's pretty significant. Yeah, so thanks. And we've got one question that you know any of you can answer. So this comes from Sham as well. She's been very active. Uh, she says, basically, how shall we reach out to kids in urban areas? I mean, we have heard your programs. You reach out to kids in rural areas, uh, in and around your projects, but there must be a lot of kids in urban areas who uh, don't get a chance to interact with field conservation, to see turtles on the ground. And yet at the same time, there's a need to raise their awareness levels on what's going on around the country, right? So, so how do we tackle this? The question is open to any of you who would like to take a step with that. Or it's, or it's like the military style, I may have me volunteer you for to, to I can, I can, I can, I can, sorry. So go, 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 doctor. Very short comment. Uh, for me, I don't, I don't really worry for the uh, kids in the urban area compared to the kids uh, at the, uh, with under the uh, digital poverty at this moment because for the kids in the urban area, they have devices and then they have internet connection and then we can do reach up just like this then we can share lots of uh, different things on the social media we can catch them on the social media if they are playing facebook twitter we just chase them even we can do tiktok and everything as long as we can chase them <laughs> <laughs> okay sure you want to say something i was going to say um we we've been relatively uh, we've had a little bit of a su success at kind of identifying friendly parties in in the right departments and then just kind of nagging them until until we can make things happen 
So is that something that we could do if you wanted to reach urban children, you, you get PPD in a certain area, you get some champions and you start you start nagging them, identify the identify the population you want to go after and see if a program can be rolled out. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I think from our experience that we get uh, companies to invite us to go to school for part of their CSR mm -hmm. program. So we, we did one in Keningau the other day. So they just um, get a few a few schools to join, um, like to be in a hall, and then we just uh, have some activities and some talks on an environment. Um, so we have different uh, NGOs coming in and giving a short talk on our pro our work. So I think that's one of the method. Maybe we can get some companies, uh, <laughs> someone to like invite us to have that yeah. talk with the children. Yeah. I think it's, it's easy to identify and isolate uh, groups of, uh, you know, segmentize the groups and you know, adults, the kids in and around the project sites. But uh, I think it's equally important as raised, the question as was raised, yeah, to, to ensure that the kids that live in and around, well, live far away from nature uh, in very developed societies, uh, don't lose out. <laughs> On the feel experience of seeing, you know, whether it's tigers or elephants or turtles, and don't, don't lose out on that because, uh, you know, they're all you um, know part sorry, of the same society, I, right? Yeah. That's not, sorry, if I yes, could Talia. add a bit on that, um, we do believe in um, um, uh, uh, education equality, right? Mm. So um, of course, we most of our education programs we focus on the rural schools. But it is also e equally important for the um, the city kids as well to um, you know learn to love about the girls. Um, um, so I think the only way right now, the best time for us to do it is to maximize the use of social media and you know uh, digital device, right? So some of them um, they have they have digital devices. So um, maybe we can. Um, come up with like a very interesting and very uh, interactive videos you know like education educational videos that they um, can always share around and just like what, what, what we are doing right now with the educational module um, something like that I think that would um, definitely benefit both um, both kids of both uh, rural and also the city kids yeah that's just my two cents Okay, so uh, we've come to the end, actually. <laughs> it's been a nice nice and engaging two hours. So I think first and foremost, I want to remind all the panelists to, to remain uh, on, on, this, on, this, on, this, uh, on the call. But you know, to all the YouTube viewers out there, I hope you now have a better understanding of the various turtle conservation projects in Malaysia and how these projects are actually impacted in more ways than one on the, the pandemic and the MCO, our inability to go out there and do what we do best. And I hope you can uh, identify ways, uh, in small ways, big ways, to support the turtle conservation that you've heard about uh, that happens in and around Malaysia. All these young scientists, these young managers, these young conservationists, uh, you know, sustainable tourism operators, all of them need your attention, need your support, so we can ensure that turtle conservation in Malaysia can continue at the same levels uh, when things become normal, if at all, that's going to be a new normal. Uh, and I hope you will provide the spotlight on our work and ensure that these people, these great people can continue their work. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so all of you uh, hang on. Uh,